Thanks to State Farm for sponsoring a portion of today's video. This was the first CG animated character in film history. And it paved the way for the entire VFX industry with a few notable inventions. We're gonna try to basically recreate this. We'll make a cool character here and then we'll shoot a short film as an homage to the original. We tend to mark the history of CGI over the last several decades by the groundbreaking characters that the technology makes possible. You know, you've got like the iconic ones, you know, Gollum. I mean, obviously we got the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, like, you know, the Abyss, we got Terminator 2. Mm -hmm. But if we go back even further, there are even earlier renditions of digital characters. Now, the very first digital character ever made was for the movie Future World. In Future World, they actually like built this like 3D model of Peter Fonda's face in a super rudimentary. There was no way to like composite that into live action footage. So they're literally pointing a camera at the computer screen like someone pirating Transformers 4. So fast forwarding a few more years, there's a couple other movies. Obviously there was Tron, we did a whole video about that, but none of those were real characters until young Sherlock Holmes. I love how it just like animates in just like all of this feels so much more advanced than the year. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, in many respects, it holds up. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. This was the first fully photorealistic CG animated character in film history. It is. And it's crazy because, you know, when you're doing, when you're the first of anything, you are in open territory and you have to navigate problems that have never been navigated. John Lasseter was the one who headed this up with the Lucasfilm Computer Graphic Division, which was under ILM at the time. And under his leadership, they executed this to perfection. And just a year later in 1986, were purchased by Steve Jobs and became Pixar. <laughs> You're talking about ILM in conjunction with Pixar forging the way for computer animated CG characters in film. I mean, it, I honestly coming into this had no idea of the significance of this shot. I think there are nine visual effect shots in this entire sequence mm. and they were revolutionary. It took them nine months. Nine months for 30 seconds of on-screen action. That is wild. And it paved the way for the entire VFX industry with a few notable, like, inventions that they made beyond just having a CGI character. So back in the day, when they wanted to animate something, you had all of these sort of like polygons and vertices on the corners of each of those polygons that they had to manually move, like one by oh one. Oh my gosh, that sounds awful. Right? It completely circumnavigates any sort of like artistic vision. So they invented this new way of animation, which we know today as just a character rig. The idea of a hierarchical character rig. I mean, the way they described it was like the branches of a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, you got the body as like the trunk. You can move the whole trunk and all of the branches move with it. And then the branches start breaking off. You can move the arm and then you can move the rest of the arm and the fingers one by one. You can animate the fingers independently, but it'll always be tracked to where my arm is, which will always be tracked where the rest of my arm and my body is. And that gives you a lot of power when you're animating because I want to move the hips here, the whole body moves. Now I just moved the upper leg, now I just adjust adjust, 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 instead of having to go uh, vertex by vertex, which sounds like a nightmare. The, there are like 82 different unique pieces forming the entirety of the stained glass man. And if they had to like animate the position and rotation of each of those pieces, it would have taken like 10 times longer. This shot is the first CG rack focus shot in cinema history. John Lasseter and his team found a way to render out depth of field, specifically for this shot. For this shot, with like the focus distance actually changing, going from the hands to his face, that would be a really hard shot to do optically because you got the matted lines being blurred at different amounts at different points. Yeah. But they did something very new at the time, which was actually rendering out the background plate digitally with the actual render itself. So this is like essentially a fully CG shot, but it's not, the background is technically a real plate. Another crazy innovation here is that this shot has camera match moving, camera tracking. They literally invented camera tracking. It was like not a thing, but they had this camera moving through 3D space. It's not just static, it's not just like pivoting around, it's literally translating through 3D space. And they had to straight up 
recreate that camera motion in post, but there were no tools. There was no After Effects camera tracker. There was no synthize. But John Lasseter was there in the church measuring every square inch of the cathedral so they could remodel it just to track that one shot. Yeah, like you press a button now and it like figures out where the camera is in real space. Heck, our phones do it in real time. I didn't know this, but in 1985, they actually had motion blur capabilities. And this is one thing that Dennis Muren, the visual effects supervisor, was very, very adamant about. Because again, these were the days of stop motion, you know? And the big holdup with stop motion is the lack of motion blur. It makes it look like it's not a part of the image. So having an accurate motion blur is very important when creating realism. And the idea behind this approach was to create the first photorealistic animated CG model. So that motion blur played a huge factor in this. But of course it came at a massive computational cost. And for you artists out there, you already know, it's still a pain in the butt to have motion blur and depth of field. So imagine 1985, trying to run that stuff for all these shots. It must have been a nightmare. Dude, I saw that for The Abyss, which was like, what, 1988 or so, the entire computer graphics department at Lucasfilm had 900 megabytes of storage. Not even a gig. And that, that was the entire crazy. department. And like our server space here is now like what, 200 terabytes? Yeah. Another thing that they did here, which I find actually really fascinating, is the idea of like selectively adding highlights to the armor. And so what they did, which seems very, very logical, John Lasseter took measurements and took note of exactly where every single light source was, the color temperature of that light source, and the intensity. And they replicated that in 3D space for the rendering of this thing. And they took a look at it and was like, it's not working. Yeah. This isn't good. Didn't feel right. Didn't feel right, exactly. And so they ended up going through and adding a whole bunch of specific lights so that they could get the correct glints. It's not exactly how it should have been in the actual footage, but it looks better. It looks more right. And that's a challenge that you face with CG characters, right? Is the, the DP on set would light for the character if the character was there. And that might change depending on what the character looks like. They might completely relight the scene if the character was actually there. So when you get into the post side, doing it literally is a great starting point, but it's not always the best solution for a good looking finish. It's still just nuts to me that they were literally doing all this almost 40 years ago. Is that 40? It is 40 years ago. Well, not quite. It was like, I mean. No, it's close. That's 84. Super close. It was like 38 years ago. <laughs> Dude. And I think this marks like a really interesting sort of like pivot point in the film industry because they are able to take all these super complicated mathematical equations and algorithms and all this stuff that they had to use for like say Tron. Remember Tron's CGI was all made with like freaking spreadsheets. But for this, they finally figured out a way to optimize the use and execution of these things so that an artist without any sort of mathematical background can use it easily, yeah, which is nuts. Yeah, it's almost like this is the first time we're seeing the artist's mind prioritized in the execution of visual effects. Yeah. It's just really fascinating to see all the challenges they face and how those challenges are still relevant today. We have far better tools, far shorter turnaround times because the ability just to make this stuff and turn it around is so much faster. But a lot of those same sort of problems will exist today. So we're gonna try to basically recreate this. We'll make a cool character here and then we'll shoot a short film as an homage to the original. But let's see if we can use our modern tools to see if we can actually do this quicker and also make it more photorealistic. Okay, okay, plan of attack. Yes. We need a stained glass man first. I would suggest one of us dress up in like some armor, we take a photo, and then we just have Griffin artistically interpret that as a stained glass thing. Mm. I like that. Hey Griffin. Yo Griffin. Griffin. Hey buddy. How's hey, it what's going? up dude? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put Jordan in some armor and I'm gonna take a photo of him and I'd love if you could just like trace over it and turn him into like a stained glass character. Just just press the stained glass filter. <laughs> Actually, I do have one of those. Wait, for real? <laughs> I don't know how, uh, how good it's gonna be, but I'll, I'll do a version with that for sure. <laughs> Dude, we're, we're in the costume room. You remember this from when Jake disappeared on us because he was being Batman? I recognize this. I'm going to be called Lori. <laughs> so we don't really have any sort of like armor. Let's see if we can make some sort of like costume that is armor-esque. Dude, already, baseball pads, those are going on you. Fantastic. Yeah, these are your leg armor. Yeah. Ooh, dude, this is from our Mad Max film. Something like that, you know? Like have that on your shoulders. I like that, I dig that. <laughs> <laughs> Just be Iron Man. Just be Iron Man, dude, stained glass Iron Man. What is that, is that a saddle? A saddle? <laughs> we gotta get you a helmet. Oh! <gasps> 
I know what we're doing. Oh yeah. So this is from like the main orc captain from our Shadow of Mordor short film. This thing is made out of pure resin, so it weighs like 10 pounds, but it looks super sweet. Wait, do you have a big head? I'd like to think so. I have awoken. <laughs> Come on, baby. If I show up in a war like this, oh, which way am I going? Wait, should we look at the picture of reference? Like, no. <laughs> We're not Dean's gonna... getting nervous. Dean's getting nervous at the creative freedom here. Look, let the creativity flow. I'm ready for a war. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous outfit I've ever seen. What happened? What went wrong? Here, try the sword. Hmm. No, no, I'm not feeling. I'm not feeling that sword. This sword's a little bit lighter. Ooh, um, kind of fits my vibe. Oh my gosh, dude! What is this made out of? Metal. Appropriate. I mean, I think this could be a good like stained glass man type sword. Good luck holding it. In T pose. As long as it's okay that I'm openly yeah, weeping in the pose. Take the sword from me. <laughs> no! Oh my god! No! I feel perfectly safe in my gear. <laughs> Enderil, the sword of Aragorn, son of Arathorn. <laughs> Thank you, my lord. Do you want like a shard blade? We got like this thing here. Oh, that's dope. That's so big. Look at this. Of this sword. Well, the original a... stained glass man was seven and a half feet tall, so it only feels right. That's a pretty legit sword, too. Yeah, I like this. I like this sword. Let's go with this one. This is like an actual shard blade. They, oh, is it really? I mean, it's not actually, but it's like the size of a shard blade. Dude, it's pretty sweet. Heck yeah. All right, I'm gonna go grab Griffin to see if he could take these photos real quick. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We got our knight in shining armor. He looks great. I just need you to take some photos of him real quick. Hey, Jordan, come on out. <laughs> oh, dude, you just broke it. The armor just broke. Hold down, hold down. What just happened? This is a tale that will be uh, immortalized in stained glass for all time. <laughs> I'm excited, dude. Okay. All right, gang. So yesterday, uh, we took this photo of our... Uh... That's what I look like? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I literally have not seen it to this point. I was able to make... Oh, dude. dude that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Wow, <laughs> dude. That's great. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh, Griffin. Yeah, yeah, this is hilarious. I see a little bit of my soul in there. This is hilarious. <laughs> Griffin, thank you, dude. This is so killer. Okay, so I guess the next bit here is to basically take this and turn that into a 3D model, which essentially just means taking it and getting an outline of it and extruding that in 3D space. So we'll probably want to like break out your, your hand into a few different pieces, your arm into a few different pieces, because mm -hmm. they're all just going to be basically flat 2D cutouts moving in 3D space separately. Mm -hmm. I'll start trying to do that while you really figure out the new deep motion thing. Dude, it worked. Are you kidding? This is literally oh, dude, it worked, freaking work, dude. Yeah. This is not what I expected. Look at this. Oh my gosh, off just a video. So I did this animation test with this program called Deep Motion that basically just takes a video of your motion and then generates 3D animation from it. And you can put in like any video too. Like you can pull like dance moves from Step Up or something into this and it'll like and get the animation of those dance moves. That's amazing. Dude, yeah, this is great. This is great. So in theory, we should be able to actually upload our own sort of rigged model to this and it'll just apply that animation data to it automatically, which would be very ideal. Okay, I believe we have all of the building blocks necessary now to proceed. Let's go ahead and shoot this short film. I really want to film this on my iPhone because there's this app I've been using called Biplay Camera and it tracks the footage in real time and it also allows me to actually use a 3D character as a stand-in for me to compose the shot properly and at the end of it all, it'll even spit out a Cinema 4D file with everything ready to go. Then after that, we'll shoot your mocap and submit that to Deep Motion to get a ready-to-go animation. All right, so I finished the edit here. I've assembled everything that we shot. <laughs> it's, it's Jordan acting across from Jordan here. Man, Jordan's dancing. 
If you want to actually see more about Jordan's dancing, we did an entire Crew Cuts episode on QuarterDigital.com. Check it out. We deep dive into what it means to dance in front of people like no one's watching. I, I might need to see the worm done in person right here, right now, if you're up to it. <laughs> so I edited this whole thing traditionally like I normally would. But normally in the next step of the process, I would kick this out to After Effects and then camera track it, lay out the ground plane, the walls, and all of this stuff to kind of build out the geometry. But no! This time around, that's already been done for me while I recorded the footage. The phone was able to essentially scan the environment here, and as you can see, here's a CG camera moving through the environment here the exact same way I was in real life. And on top of that, it's projecting the footage onto this geometry here. Everything is already set up at real world scale. I should be able to just drop in the animation, which I made to be seven feet tall, and it'll just fit. Automating all of those processes allowed me to kind of spend a lot of my creative energy on dialing in the materials. I was able to build out the actual textures and the look of stained glass, right? You know glass, it's see-through, but one of the things Dennis Murin said was that everything seemed very flat and they ended up adding something like six or seven layers of sort of like scratches and, and little bubbles and whatnot, just to add extra detail to the actual textures. And I've done that here too. You can see all of the scratches I've added to the glass, and the glass is also slightly transparent, so you can see through it. But one of the things I discovered when doing this was that it wasn't looking how I needed it to look until I actually added that color channel into the emission channel. So technically, the glass is emitting a little bit of light, just a little bit, just enough to kind of like boost the color values just a little bit. I don't know if adding an emissive channel like that to this is technically realistic, but you know what? It looks better this way. And so you know what? I don't feel so bad. I think because it looks good, it works. That's what I learned from Dennis Mirren. So there's still a lot of work left to do here. I've actually got to set up each scene, render them out. And once I've done that, I'm excited to show Jordan because he had to move on to busting an eyeball. And that's great, but he's going to love this. I'm very, I'm very tired today. I'm very tired, but you know what? The video's done. This ended up being more work than I expected, but hey, that's the theme of this channel. <laughs> I gotta say, I honestly feel pretty guilty. Ren shouldered so much of this, and I have not seen the final product, and I'm incredibly excited. I'll talk about what happened with this process once we've watched it, but for now, I'm gonna hit play. That's awesome. Nice work, man. That, that was, was a lot of shots. That's like 12. That was 12 shots. That was 12 VFX oh, shots. Oh, bang on. And the entire thing was filmed on my phone. So I ended up doing a little bit more like manual tweaking of the animation than I expected to need to do. The deep motion animation ended up working very well to get something, but uh -huh. it's not exactly like high fidelity, you know? It's not gonna be as good as a motion capture suit or hand animating something, but it is so much faster. <laughs> and then of course I kept refining the actual glass texture. So that ended up being a bit of a challenge. So one piece of inspiration I took from the original movie was the fact that they have a shot in there that was entirely rendered out of the computer. Even though they're using the play photography, they didn't like have to like recombine it with track mats with the footage like they did for the other shots. They're just like, well, it's gonna be out of focus. Let's just render it out and that's the final image. And we're looking at another one right here. This is entirely CG. And I love, I remember I saw, I saw you working on this one in particular. It's awesome because you're able to dial in the depth of field here in a way that we couldn't do in camera. Mm -hmm. Because all the textures that we see are projection from a camera 
onto the planes in your CGC. Correct. And what's cool is you're actually getting the light playing through the glass and casting red into the yes, shadow. And that's what I was hoping for, but I wasn't sure if it was going to work out, and it did. I was yes. so happy. I mean, it's not clear, it's very subtle. Yeah. You, you can see that there's like some red glow. You can clearly subtly see that there's some red glow. The fact that two of us were able to make this in a week mm -hmm. is, it, the, the fact that this is possible <laughs> at all yeah. is incredible yeah. to me. There was no precedent for any of that stuff that they were doing for the original movie. Like the ideas they had were the first time these ideas were had. It's, it's hard to even wrap your mind around that because I, I'm of the mindset that if I don't have a help page online or a YouTube tutorial that answers yeah. my problems. <laughs> yeah. I just assume it's impossible. <laughs> and they, that was like their calling card. They're like, well, no, we'll just make it. We'll make it from scratch. Yeah. That's a special type of person that can do that. And th to have like a, a, a small little house full of these guys that would go on to do such great things. And like, this was the birth, like at the top of all the characters we know and love throughout history, there is the stained glass man. We gotta dive in, we gotta take a look, we gotta unlock the, the secrets of, of all these amazing techniques that were developed just for this and put our own little spin on it. I feel like we excavated the shoes from these ancient <laughs> artists and oh, put them on our feet and walked along the same path somehow. But like, we were able to put insoles in the excavated shoes this, this and is, like modern shoelaces. This is my top 10 favorite metaphors I think. <laughs> I really enjoy doing these sort of like historical deep dives because I take for granted the sort of access to technology and just the general vastness of knowledge that we have today. Yeah, I'd love to do it more. So. No, oh, same, exactly. There are so many movies out there that I do not know enough about. Mm -hmm. Leave a comment down below. What should we dive into next? I personally was very satisfied to see you dancing for this video <laughs> and to get that out there. And if you want to actually know more about that whole sort of dancing... My, my dancing origin story. <laughs> <laughs> the video is on quarterdigital.com. There's a two-week free trial. Just yeah, go do it. Come on.